We've already talked about the uh, to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Yep. Um, the truth shall, shall set you free. I've heard you mention that in a, in a lot of seminars. Yeah. Um, the, truth, the truth is an essential factor with receiving love. It's like, um, as I described in a very recent talk that I gave, just a few a month or so ago, when I, a talk called Relationship with God, The Way, I called it. In that talk I described, there's basically three essential factors when it comes to receiving divine love. The first one is humility. Humility is an openness to receiving truth. So, so when I'm humble, I have a passionate desire to receive truth. I have a passionate desire to experience truth as well, to actually physically, emotionally experience it as well as receive it. As far as religion goes, I... Uh, uh prerequisite for that would have to be that you have no preconceived ideas of what you believe is true correct which which i see as the stumbling block for a lot of churches in that because they believe the bible as the god the word of god yes um they then have this preconceived idea of what is true and anything that contradicts it, yep. which you yourself do and did yes. in the first century as well with the books at that time, yes. um, they cannot accept any of that yes. as being true yes. because of that preconception. Yes. So many Christians have become like the Pharisees in the first century mm. in the sense that the Pharisees became very dogmatic when it came to the, particularly the first five books of the Bible and in particular the law, what they called the law. And they then made sure that all people who properly practiced the Jewish faith at the time practiced the law as found in those books. And as a result of that, they were very, very close to any new concept or new idea, particularly new ideas surrounding love, because mm. the law would always uh, be more important to them, have a higher priority than love did. And as a result of that, they became very resistive to any additional or further truth being presented mm. to them. Now, as most teachers do, I tried to join up things so that you could you know, see the principle involved in the law and then expose it even further by expounding it further and seeing the principle in a wider community or in a wider area. And, uh, but that didn't go down very well because that, they felt that was a dilution of the law. You know, uh, so, uh, and, and just like a Christian today feels mm. like what I would be teaching would be a dilution mm. of the Bible, God's Word. So the very first requirement to connect to God is humility. Humility is the complete desire and openness to receive truth no matter what it is and whether you disagree with it or not. <laughs> and uh, to have a passionate desire in that regard is humility. So that's point number one. And I talked about humility quite frequently in the first century. The second point that I would say, the reason why you're humble is so that you can receive truth. It's the mm. truth that creates freedom. When you know the truth about any subject, you are free to utilize its laws. So, for example, a scientist discovering the truth about uranium and how it can be utilized can now produce nuclear fusion or nuclear fission. Um, mm. Some use it badly, some use it well, um, but the scientist can discover the law involved or the laws involved and then utilize the law to the benefit of mankind or otherwise depending on how they use this law and and with the truth the truth always results in this absolute freedom to discover and utilize things in any manner you wish and so the truth does set you free literally as well as spiritually and then the truth sets you so free that you are now completely open to absorbing love so so the truth you can think of it as humility is the doorway to truth and truth is the doorway to love. Mm. Without going through those stages, it's impossible to receive divine love. And even the truth about ourselves. Even the truth about yourselves. Which is one of the hardest things. Yes. And it is the thing that pe most people find the most difficult. Mm. Because the truth about ourselves has an emotional impact upon us. Whereas the external truth, although it does have an emotional impact, usually has less of an emotional impact upon us than the truth about ourselves. It's the truth about ourselves or themselves that most people cannot cope with. Mm. And therefore, 
are unable to receive God's love up into beyond a certain point. Mm. So they absorb the truth about the universe because they're so enthusiastic about that and they feel quite fascinated about that. So they absorb the truth, all of that truth, which opens them to a certain amount of God's love. Mm. But then they refuse to absorb the truth about themselves, where they're being unloving, where they're being unkind, where they're being untruthful, where they're being, you know, where they're out of harmony with love in their mm. day-to-day life. And that then causes them to stagnate in their relationship with God. So, so without humility, we will not have the doorway into truth. Without truth, we don't have the doorway to receive God's love open. And those are the three things that I taught primarily in the first century everywhere I went. Mm. And they're still the same teachings now as they've ever been. The truth doesn't change. And so what I'm teaching now is almost identical uh, in nature to what I taught then. You've mentioned a little bit God's laws now. Mm -hmm. Did you talk about that as much in the first century? Yes, I did. There's there's not much... There's not much uh, biblical uh, evidence of that, is there? I wouldn't agree. Um, if you look at almost every parable, every power parable had one of God's laws involved okay. in it. So if you look, say, at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, for example, then there was a law that when you die, you are substantially unchanged. There is a law that involves that, which is the law of the transformation of the soul, the law of love. And there, there was also a law regarding the spirit world involved in that. The people who are in the heavens can see the people who are in the hells. And there was so there was a spiritual a law of rapport between locations in the spirit world. That illustration also pointed out that there was different locations in the spirit world. Uh, locations that are dependent upon the condition of the person and how they treated other people while they were alive. So there are a lot of laws mentioned in that one parable. The way I used to mention them was not in a... I didn't tag them so much with a... with a um, what you would call a label nowadays. I, I mention the law in a practical situation or environment, which I often do nowadays as well. But in addition to that, I also give them a name, mm-hmm. which I didn't do as much in the first century. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, the forgiveness of sin. Mm-hmm. Um, how, did, how did you explain that in, in the first century? Exactly the same way as I explain it now. And that is that uh, God always forgives our sin. But we have to go through a process before it will transform us. The forgiveness of sin transforms us. And we also need to learn how to forgive others. Because if, if you can't forgive, you will always eventually embrace the law of eye for an eye, tooth for, for a tooth. And that law has its de- has detrimental and devastating effects on humanity. So I back back in the first century taught both principles: the principle of forgiveness, not only forgiveness of yourself, but also forgiveness of your brother or sister, and also the principle of repentance, which was this principle that if you if you actually felt emotionally felt what you had done to another then God's love could transform you through this process and, and it was the feeling of being forgiven by God that mm. you went through as a, proce- as a part of that process. Yep. And I discussed those uh, things with people in the first century at length. Yep. Yeah. The sins of the fathers are visited on the children. Yes, I definitely talked about that. That's what you would call, and, and, and if you think about it now, what I'm trying to do is explain how that occurs. And how that occurs is the, if you like, the sinful or the unloving emotions that are retained within the parent have an impression upon the life of the child to such an extent that the child absorbs them and it becomes a part of their soul which causes their own degradation of their own body. So in other words, it causes all disease and all sickness. And these principles I taught in the first century and I'm teaching now as well. And the terminology I'm using is a little different now because the background of the people that I'm speaking to is a little different now. Um, Many of them have some kind of spiritual awareness or understanding. Um, Many of them have some kind of, you know, Christian or New Age or Buddhist or or Hindu or some other kind of background where I can compare things with. In the first century, because I had a more limited scope of teaching, I could only compare it with the teachings of Moses, which was what the basis was of for the mm-hmm. Pharisees' belief systems, 
and and most of the Jews who I was speaking to belief systems and some of the Samaritans belief systems also were based on that so so that's why I focused on the comparisons with that particular religious system nowadays I've got a larger scope to work with in that there's a comparison of different religious systems that I can work with and I can incorporate many of those understandings in order to help people understand the the truth about the particular thing that I'm teaching and and help them come from where they are from their perspective into accepting that truth as much as I'm able so the key with teaching a lot of times is helping a person go through this humility barrier which is the barrier to receiving new truth and the way that you can do that is by connecting to them on the current truths that are in their current way of life or their current mm -hmm. religious circumstances or their day-to-day -day experience and then drawing them in to see how it's different to what they thought through a process of showing them how it's different. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's a similar process I used in the first century, but, but the scope was different because I had a more limited audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, your teaching of the truth obviously put a lot of people's noses out of joint. Yep. Um, and you've related the story of the clearing of the temple um, but a little bit different to the biblical story in yeah. that you were not the aggressor. No. I've played Jesus in a play, yeah. in, a, in a musical, and I did the upturning of the tables. Yeah. Uh, I had longer hair and looked a bit more like you <laughs> and, uh, and portrayed a very angry, and you, you weren't like that at all. No, no. Well, there's no need to be angry. Um, anger always comes from an emotion where you're afraid, generally. And I wasn't afraid. Um, and I didn't actually upturn the tables either. Um, all, I, all as I have explained about the issue, all I did was, was yell out at the top of my voice <laughs> um, about the, how wrong the entire temple system was in terms of how they were fleecing people. Mm. And all I did was point that out. And, uh, and as people do have a habit of doing once the truth is pointed out to them, they feel quite strong about it and quite emotional about it and many of them got quite angry as a result and uh, as a result there was a bit of a riot in the temple um, clear, where everybody was upset with the money changes and how much money they were making and how they were being ripped off and so forth. It was yeah. something that everybody felt and all I did was say it. Mm. Yeah. Now this made you a bit of a target for the Sanhedrin. Not really. Uh, they didn't. This was a minor event for them in comparison with other things um, other things see I spoke the truth about everything which meant the truth about the Pharisees condition emotional condition their soul condition how how their condition in love so when somebody would come up and ask me about a certain Pharisee if I knew them then I could talk about their condition and of course there are only 70 something Pharisees on the Sanhedrin um, so sooner or later you were going to finish up talking about most of them and their condition and of course, you know, those things would be related to others and that would be related to others. And, and the Pharisees sort of, and, and the people on the Sanhedrin, both the Sadducees and the Pharisees sort of started to view that as a subversion, you know, of, their, of them, of their position. On top of that, I would talk about the unfairness of how the temple was run. Um, the inability of sacrifice to actually relieve a person from their sins, for example, was another thing that I'd speak of. And so all of these things were basic tenets of the religious faith. So they then also felt that I was undermining their faith as well. So you had a whole heap of men, all of whom were quite addicted to power and control, now having their control and power undermined by one man's actions. In addition, you had the whole system of things, which, which, which often put a lot of money into their purse, uh, in the case of the Sadducees, many of them received up to two or to three tons of silver every single year as a result of the taxes that they levied upon the people. So we're talking about, nowadays you'd be talking about billions of dollars worth of funds mm -hmm. going into these people's pockets, which, which was now being threatened. Their own personal uh, condition was being undermined in the sense that uh, I was now exposing that they were like whitewashed graves, uh, you know, on the outside all appearing good but on the inside with quite malicious intent and on top of that um, 
I was speaking about the truths of something that they couldn't really understand, the truths of love, you know, this whole principle of love. And that they started to see that if love was practiced by everybody, that they might not even have a religious faith in the end to defend. And so um, there was quite a lot of problems, as you can see, and quite a lot of discussions the Pharisees had, of which my father was privy because he was a member mm. of the Sanhedrin. So... And eventually I found out about it. Of course, my father wouldn't tell me everything that was said. He would just give me an indication, yeah, they're not very happy with you, and <laughs> this is the reason why, and you shouldn't do that. Anyway, that was his opinion too. You know, Up, mm. to, up to this point, he was quite, he felt in quite a lot of disagreement with me about many of these issues because mm. he felt I was undermining his faith. Yeah. So um, Josephus is the uh, historian, mm -hmm. one of the... I think the only historian outside the Bible that mentions your existence mm -hmm. as a miracle worker and a healer mm -hmm. and a teacher mm -hmm. of, uh, of a, a great renown and that uh, you were revered after your death. Um, miracles aside from healing, were there any of those? Well, it depends what you classify as a miracle, I suppose. Um, Anything supernatural like... Uh, well, I guess. levitating things all those kind of things mm. well the reality is while I was aware that such things could be done I didn't see much point to them about from a perspective of teaching people how to become more loving in fact I viewed them almost uh, and I also viewed many of the miracles this way as almost a distraction from teaching people how to become more loving because most of the time they would finish up focusing on the miracle and not on the love that created the miracle. So, so then you'd have a clamour of people wanting to be healed from all of their different ailments, not understanding how the healing had occurred. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when I didn't heal those particular ones, they'd be very angry and upset with me uh, because I couldn't heal those ones because of their demand and their anger and their rage. And, you know, mm -hmm. they weren't in a space where I could heal them. That's only a person who's in a humble... Mm -hmm truth desirous place that you can actually heal who has faith and so so what eventually would happen with a lot of the so-called miracles that I did um, was that they'd be blown out of all proportion in terms of uh, you know turning me into some kind of god like cult figure um, and on top of that um, distorting my message um, mm which was a message that love, and if you come to love, you can do these things for yourself and others. And, and unfortunately, what would eventually happen is many people would come to me demanding a miracle, which of course could not then be given. Um, and that would also then often distort the message uh, because they then felt that I was being selective with how I was using my powers and so forth. So, you know, there, were, there was a lot of confusion about mm about the truth and so I, I took every opportunity I could to explain how it works just like I do nowadays um, and often explain at length but unfortunately when people are emotionally in turmoil um, they don't really want to hear the explanation they just want the healing or mm -hmm. they just want the miracle and this is a problem when you're teaching the truth when you're teaching divine truth you're not going to give people the miracle just for the sake of the miracle and uh, and so I often feel and still feel that uh, that while miracles are going to occur and will occur in the process of becoming at one with God and afterwards, um, if they become the focus of attention, then I see a problem with that mm -hmm. because now, now we're not in a space of love but in a space of demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Now your death... Um, I've heard you describe it some length. We mm -hmm. probably don't have time to go into all of that. But you said it... Um, um, you haven't got to my meeting Mary yet or anything? Oh, yes, I thought <laughs> I had that down. Um, actually, uh, yes, when was the first time you met Mary? Can you recall the first day you met Mary and where yeah, that I can. was? Yeah, yeah we, um, she was in Mag Magdala, the, the city in which, or the town in which she, she lived. She She... By this stage, she had a very checkered history. She, when she was young, she um, was abused by her father. Um, she eventually became pregnant, and her father then sold her as a prostitute. Um, 
she gave birth to a child which she lost through this through the process that she can describe she uh, then had a number long a number of a long series of very traumatic events sexually that occurred to her um, that eventually caused her to become a prostitute herself and uh, and she became a quite a wi widely renowned one as well because she she became quite angry in her prostitution which meant that she finished up being quite overt sexually and and people were just fascinated by her sexually and um, then she went through a period where she just found a old older man who she eventually became a mistress to and he loved her in the sense that he you know lavished everything that he had on her and and she then didn't have to be with any other men so she didn't and in fact she didn't it wasn't even with him he sort of had this sort of a goddess view of her um, so by the time she met me she was actually in business as a uh, you'd call it a fashion uh, probably in fashion nowadays like you know materials she used to work with textiles and materials okay. and and make clothing and she had quite a number of women working for her who were all from her similar background who she'd rescued from a similar background and um, so by the time I met her um, she she heard about me through the different healings that had occurred in other towns that I'd visited and usually by this stage now when I came into a town people had heard about me before I arrived and so they'd come and see and she came with a group of women to see me and by this stage she was um, pretty much uh, her own woman uh, the man she was living with didn't really care what she did as long as he could idolize her at all occasions he was a fair bit older you said yeah much older mm. and he died shortly after I met her actually okay. but he willed everything to her so she was also quite wealthy as a result mm. um, after after he passed mm. And uh, yeah, I met her just walking into the town. Uh, she was there with a group of women, and I yeah. instantly recognised her as my soulmate. And um, and then it was a process that we went through after that. And she became one of the disciples. And well, it wasn't quite that simple. Um, there was a whole series of events surrounding Mary and her past history and so forth that affected uh, what happened. Uh, and also her emotional condition that affected what happened before we actually finished up, before I finished up marrying her. And so how long was her. it before you married her, after you met her? Well, we spent nearly three months together initially, not sexually, because I wouldn't engage with her sexually because of her emotional injuries regarding sexuality that she was trying to control me with. So she was trying to use her sexuality to control me and I wouldn't engage with it. And eventually she got very, very angry and upset with me. And she had sex with a couple of the disciples uh, so that I could see it and, um, and in a way to punish me. And, uh, and then she felt so ashamed of her actions that I didn't see her for one year after that. And she went home and dealt with a lot of her emotions about sexuality and my feelings for her and things like that. I explained to her that I loved her. Um, during that time and so forth but she she was always now used to being able to manipulate a man sexually and uh, and on top of that because she had a checkered history and she was well well known of having a history many of the disciples who followed me left me after she be she became my wife so they refused to follow me after that um, so they saw my they picked out Dud picked out some other women that I should be with which I didn't know weren't my soulmate, so I wasn't with them. Uh, but the disciples felt that I was very wrong making the decision to be with Mary. Mm. And they often tormented Mary when I wasn't around as a result. And many of the women and men treated her very badly. So badly, in fact, some of the men eventually after my death raped her. Um, some of the so-called Peter raped her after my death, two days after my death. Even though she was your wife, yeah and he was so called somebody a so called me. friend yeah yep. how did that play out later on when you say later on when when you uh spoke to him about this after he'd passed well yeah he obviously peter had a lot of quite dark emotions that he passed with and he spent some time in the hills after he passed um 
until he was willing to face his own emotional condition, as everybody has to do when they pass, or if they don't do it before then. And so he had uh, quite a, a dark condition to face. He, he'd raped my soulmate. He'd, he'd uh, raped other women as well, uh, quite a number of them. Um, he's quite an angry man. And he had a terrible viewpoint of women generally. And uh, yeah, so he, he actually passed. I wouldn't be hanging out with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> why were you? Uh, why were these th these men don't sound like suitable character to be your company? Well, this is a, I find it quite ironic actually. What, what what most Christians today would view as a suitable character for my company. In the Bible, it does say the truth about who kept my company. And what does it say? It says that I was known to have consorted with the tax collectors and the sinners. And the reality is that most of the people who were associated with me were well and truly sinners in the mm. sense that they had a lot of pretty dark emotions, you know. Four of the so-called apostles, and they weren't my apostles, but four of the ones listed in the Bible were, were basically terrorists. Um, <laughs> so mm. there are lots of people who I was associated with in the first century that I was trying to teach about love. Okay, so and you didn't really have a... A closeness as a friendship like you know you, you would uh, these days like I would choose a friend who's fairly similar in character and ethics and morals to myself I probably wouldn't want to you know you'd judge them <laughs> <laughs> in other words <laughs> no I wouldn't judge I just wouldn't choose to be around them I, you know I, 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 well, I, I just I, from commonality I, well, I choose to be around anybody who wants to hear the truth while they want to hear it if they no longer want to hear it, then then I probably won't be around them. Now, Peter often said he wanted to hear the truth, so I told him the truth. Mm. And he often didn't want to hear it, of course, you know, but he said he wanted to, and so he always got a dose of it. So who was the smartest out of the out of the disciples? Who who caught on the quickest? Intellectually the smartest or soul the smartest? Soul. <laughs> John. Who? John. Aside from Mary. Mary was the caught on the quickest, mm. being my soulmate. It was undoubtable she was going to, but aside from the of the male disciples, John mm -hmm. was was the person who understood the divine truth the most by the time of my passing. He was the only one present at my death, really, the only male present at my death. Mm -hmm. Andrew might have been present at my death, but in a, at a distance. John was right close by where I could see him, mm -hmm. and he was there with four of four of the girls, but um, my soulmate included. But Quite a number of the women understood the divine truth far better, but uh, but the men struggled uh, because of arrogance and other emotions. Mm. They all struggled. Now the Sermon on the Mount did that take place? Not not uh, a lot of the things stated in the Bible recollection of the Sermon on the Mount I did actually state, but not at one lo one at time or location. Mm. So it's sort of like an amalgamation of a lot of the teachings of and truth. And were there thousands of people? Or? Well, there are often thousands of people listening to me, yes. Um, so you did have large crowds? Yeah, often, um, where it was possible and where the, you know, the dy dy dynamics of the location allowed for that to occur, yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people had a really soul longing for truth. That's why it, people wanted to listen because they had a soul, it, there was a soul longing for truth in them and they wanted to listen to it. So that often followed me to a location. And it was quite frequent that in a town that I'd ride up, uh, roll up to, you know, a lot of the people from the town would eventually come and listen to the guy who healed such and such or whatever, you know. Mm. Um, so a lot of times the healings became a bit of a um, impetus for them to listen initially. And then of the people, of those people, some of them became serious about the truth, you know, about the divine truth. Yeah. Now, you've said it's impossible to raise someone from the dead. So Lazarus wasn't dead? Not in the sense that, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it, in the sense that so-called clinically dead nowadays, and you can get people back from that location, you know, by giving them a jump start. Mm. Um, you know, he was in a similar condition. Um, he wasn't dead in the sense that the silver cord had been broken the silver cord is the joining between the the spirit body and the material body and if that breaks it's impossible to bring someone back from that location 
So once that cord breaks, then the person is always and always going to be a spirit. Also, I didn't have any um, feelings about death because I knew what death was. It was just a transition into another life. And I, because I spoke to spirits regularly about the life they lived, I knew what kind of life it was. I could see it. Uh, you know, I could see them often living their life and therefore I could see what kind of life people would have when they pass. So I didn't see death as a uh, well, as an enemy like people do today um, or people do that in the first century as well. They, they viewed it as their enemy. So even your own death, I've heard you describe that you actually didn't suffer. No, no. Mary suffered far more than I suffered in my own death. Um, you know, there was some physical pain, but you can detune from physical pain through the process of, you know, regulation from your soul. And while you're in a state of love, you can actually completely detune from physical pain. You don't have to experience any physical pain at all. So, um, so I didn't experience much physical pain at all in the process. My body was exhausted, though, so there was a state of exhaustion because of mm. the amount of blood that I'd lost. Um, but it wasn't a painful experience. It was just an exhausted experience. Mm. Um, Mary, on the other hand, because of her condition being in more fear than I was, she and being my soulmate, she could feel my feelings. And whereas those feelings pass through her, um, she experienced more pain as a result. So she actually experienced more pain at my death than I did. Mm. Now you weren't hung on a cross. It was a stake. Was yeah, I was hung in the Jewish way, which was uh, basically a vertical pole. Is that, this how the Romans hung Jews, not how the Jews executed No, it's them. how the Jews hung Jews. Did they? And the reason why the Romans decided to do it this way on this day was because a pilot wanted to illustrate that he had to have nothing to do with my death, that it wasn't his responsibility. So normally what a Roman would do would have hang him on a cross like they would normally do. But, uh, and you'd die over a long period of days using that method of death. Um, usually it was quite a number of days. Many survived up to three days hanging like that before they died. Um, whereas hanging like a Jew, uh, the Jews way of hanging is very traumatic on the body, but very, very intense but short in comparison. So all of the weight is placed upon uh, the midsection of your body and it tears apart, literally tears apart, um, because of being hung vertically where you can't support your weight with any uh, on the sides of your body at all. Mm. It's all just hanging from, from one point. But you've said that you suffered uh, more in the beating beforehand than the beating beforehand practically killed you. Yeah, the beating beforehand was pretty bad. It's very similar to what's depicted in the movie um, that Mel Gibson made, The no, Passion. I haven't seen it. And um, so the beating beforehand was pretty bad. They, they, they used whips with, with, um, with nails and hooks in them. So, so the skin would be pulled apart in layers, quite often quite, quite down to the bone. And so during that process, the reason why I couldn't carry the stake myself was because it just I was too exhausted by that stage due to loss of blood to even carry it. Um, yeah, so so that that was um, that's a certainly more intense. And there's also the projection of emotion that was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. So you've got quite a number of people around you laughing at you, deriding you, and while they're ripping your body to pieces as well. Now I've heard you say that. You didn't have to. You chose. You did, you could have escaped the whole thing if you wanted to. Well, I'd escaped a number of other times. Um, there were quite a number of attempts in my life during the time that I was with Mary. And, um, you know, I'd been stabbed a number of times. I'd had the, they'd sent some assassins to assassinate me a number of times. The Sanhedrin had. And uh, in each case, the assassin, there was due to their own law of attraction, um, the assassin never got to a point where they could kill my body instantly. And so I could heal it straight away. So I actually healed my own body a number of times from different assailants. Um, but um, 
um, the Jewish Sanhedrin then thought, well, the only way we're going to make sure of this is to make it a sort of a state and religious sanctioned death to really just make sure of the deed. And so they gave up sending assassins. And, um, and actually, um, John, by this stage, had passed, uh, John the Baptist, and he actually came to told me, tell me the night before, the night uh, that I was picked up by the Romans uh, they, and brought to the Sanhedrin. They, uh, um, he, he told me that they, that was going to happen and I had an opportunity to leave if I wanted to. Um, yeah. But you chose not to. Was this uh, as a demonstration, a further demonstration well, things were sort of reaching a bit of a crescendo in terms of the belief systems of all of the disciples. Most of the disciples were not following my teachings. They did not have much faith in what I was actually saying. They, had, uh, they were listening to me, but a lot of it was out of fascination rather than conviction. In addition, um, there was the additional problem that the things that I was saying, while they sounded wonderful, and while I could heal myself, nobody else could. And so there was this tendency for them all to start treating me as if I was somehow unique, uh, that they weren't capable of the same particular things that I was capable of. And so they had this tendency to dismiss their own progression, to dismiss the fact that they could actually do it and themselves, to get closer to God. Many of them had not relied on God at all up to that point. They had, had, they just, God was really an intellectual concept of which they really did not have any emotional connection to. And the majority of them had not received any divine love at this point. So aside from Mary, John, and a lot, uh, some of the women, but not many of the men, um, most of them had not received divine love, so therefore had not changed very much. And I was looking at all of these issues and going, and looking at, well, you know, how long is it going to take before somebody actually embraces the principles of truth? And um, so I, the only consideration I had really was Mary, like I wanted to spend time with Mary. Um, that was the only reason why I healed myself on previous occasions, uh, because I really wanted to spend more time with Mary. Um, but I got to the point too where I could see that Mary also wouldn't deal with her emotions about certain matters um, and so our relationship sort of was also coming to some point of stagnation as well in the sense that she w didn't want to work through some of her emotional issues either and so it really got to the point now where I was left with the decision well what, what do, what's the next thing I do to help everybody go through a process that they need to go through but they don't want to go through uh, or they're not choosing to go through and um, and I could see that night and the reason why I prayed a lot that night with God is I could see that my death would possibly accomplish more than my staying alive mm. and um uh Okay. Um, Can you see why? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. See, when I died, all of a sudden the real emotions of everybody became present. And the people who needed to cry, cried. Mm. And the people who got angry, got angry. And the people, you know, who had no faith, got some faith. And there was just this whole process of that ha happened quite rapidly after my passing, in the 50 days after my passing. And to such an extent that that God's love flowed into groups of people at a time, which never happened before I passed. So, so before I passed, God's love would flow into individuals occasionally, mm -hmm. based on their passion and desire for truth and their humility. But generally, even collectively, it wouldn't happen because it, there was just so much resistance to the truth and resistance to humility. Whereas after I passed, they they were so gutted by my passing, and the spirits who were present at the time still call it the great loss. So, even my spirit friends in the spirit world still refer to it as the time of the great loss, because 
for them it meant God's love was lost as well. There was this feeling that God's love was completely lost to humanity as well. But it had the opposite effect. So it had this opposite effect of Mm. them going into grief. Mm. And as a result of their going into grief, God's love could flow into them, their openness to their emotions and their humility allowed God's love to flow. Mm. Yeah. And so those for those 50 days afterwards, um, many of them received quite a lot of divine love as a result. And, um, and as a result of that, things changed quite rapidly after them. Mm. More so than if I'd not passed. Mm. If I'd not passed, it would have maintained or been much the same as it was before. So it did have the effect that you thought it probably would. Yeah, yeah, it did have the effect that I thought it would have. Um, the the downside, of course, was that Mary and I were separated. And I didn't see the birth of my daughter and quite a number of other things. Mm. Yeah. Now, your resurrection. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, where did they take your body after that? Well, firstly, they just left my body on the stake. Um, and... The by this time Andrew was near John, and there were the girls, my mother, her, her, her my aunt, one of my aunts, John's mother, Mary, and one of a couple of Mary's friends were all there. And they saw me die, and then they removed me down from the stake. They had to do it before the Passover began. The, the uh, sorry, the Sabbath began, and so. Um, so they all worked on my body. They took me down uh, before that began. And then they embalmed my body, which was the custom. So mm. um, with basically just with oils and, and perfumes and, and so forth. Now, oh, and I watched all of that occur and watched Mary's grief. And, yeah. Now, you said that you've dematerialized your body now this is where I get a little bit lost <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is not a not not something that I'm over familiar with well when I was alive I realized that uh, a person who was at one with God who understood God's laws could understand the laws governing matter so you could materialize and dematerialize things in other words you could bring matter together to such an extent that it forms a solid shape or you could disintegrate matter into their individual atomic structures. So, so making it look like it's invisible now. So in other words, it will disappear. And I realized those kind of things when I was alive. I didn't see much point in teaching them uh, because I felt my primary purpose was teaching about love and this connection with God. But, but I realized that there was all these other things that I could show in the future if, I, if, if, if it got to that point. And that's why I said to the disciples, there are many more other things that I'd love to teach you, but you're just not ready for them yet. But um, what happened after a pass is I realized that most of the disciples, or also <coughs> the Sanhedrin and others, would, would come to see my body, as did many previously, as sort of like a sacred relic. And this was not something that I could see as very advantageous to the divine truth. But also I wanted to illustrate that death, the transition that death brings, which is a transition into a spirit form, which can materialize a body whenever it wants. So what I was trying to illustrate was the ability for a person in a spirit form to materialize a physical form any time they want to, if they wish to use it. So there was no limitations of death. In other words, there was nothing, you know, there's nothing you couldn't do when you're dead that you couldn't do when you're alive. Um, that I wanted to remove death as an enemy because death and the human race still views death as the enemy that's why that's why you threaten somebody with death and they'll do almost anything because mm. they see death as the enemy um, they don't actually see moral issues or any other issues as enemies but they see death as so what I wanted to do is illustrate that that death wasn't an enemy in fact for many people death is actually turns out to be a very great friend because it relie- relieves them of all sorts of problems in their earthly life and enhances their experience, enhances their life. So so what I decided to do, and it was a personal decision that I made, was to dematerialize the body so that none of the disciples could be attached to that body and also that everyone would see the principles that I was trying to teach them when I was alive about death. 
that there was such a thing as life after it. And the only way I could see doing that is to dematerialize the body so they could see I'm not using the same body, but it's still me. Mm -hmm. And then materialize a number of different bodies and appear to different ones of them. So when you material, when you say materialized a number of different bodies, mm -hmm. is this why Mary didn't recognize you? Uh, Initially, yes. Initially? Physically couldn't recognize me because it wasn't the same body. So but what sort of body was it? Well, I just materialized another man, like another what, body, like, like the one I have now is just a material body. And I just materialized a diff one that looked different, but, but my personality was still there, obviously, and Mary recognized that as soon as she began talking to me. <coughs> so, and as did most of the disciples, mm. whenever I started talking. And when you materialized a body for Thomas, mm -hmm. you materialized a body with injuries because he was dead. Well, in that case, I materialized my, a body that looked very similar to my original body. But I actually had the holes. I materialized the body with the holes in my wrists and my foot and my feet. Because it, he was struggling, Thomas. My, Thomas was my brother. And he was struggling um, to understand that I could be resurrected or, or mm. living still. When he had saw me die, he'd saw my dead body, and he, he didn't believe, most of the men didn't believe Mary. Like, I, I appeared to Mary the most, of course, after I passed, uh, but most of the men didn't believe her, you know, as was the custom back then, you didn't believe a woman at all. In fact, you know, if you wanted two witnesses to anything, the two witnesses couldn't be two women. Mm. So uh, they had to be men. So, um, Unfortunately, most people didn't believe what Mary was saying, and so I needed to provide further evidence, which I did do on quite a lot of occasions. So I appeared to almost 500 people after my resurrection, so-called resurrection, mm. um, in between that, in that 50-day period. Mm. Okay, now you moved then on to the spirit world. Yep. Um, was it what you were expecting? Yeah, of course. <laughs> who met you there? Ah, uh, well, you know, um, a lot of the people who had been my guides met me at first. So, so I, at the time, I had around seventeen guides, and uh, and you know, I met most of them. So Moses and Elisha and Elijah, and I met uh, um, who else would you know? There's some that you would don't know, but Michael, uh, who you know of as the Archangel Michael, and. Um, you know, ones like that, they were, they were present. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to visit the hells. So I spent quite a lot of my time going through the hells, talking to them about... So um, part of the Nicene Creed is right, you descended into the hell and... Yeah, I did, yeah. I, I, talk, I descended into, not in my condition, my condition still remained bright, but I decided to visit the hells for the sake of... Um, for the sake of teaching people in the hills that God's love was available to them, mm. basically, and that they could choose a different way of progression if they decided to, that would speed up their life in becoming happy again. And so I spent quite a bit of time teaching in the hills, um, in between in between spending time with my soulmate and and shortly after Sarah was born and I became Sarah's guide um, as well. So. So I would guide Sarah and communicate with Sarah as she was a child and as she was growing up. Mm. Yeah. Where's Sarah now? Now, 20th century now. Mm. Um, she, she lives in Canada now. Um, she's, re she's also reincarnated. Um, Luke and Sarah is a soul, are a soulmate couple and they've both returned to Earth. And they're in uh, Canada? Yeah. What, mm. what place in Canada? They're on the um, east coast of Canada. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Now we'll go to memories of the spirit world. Unless there's something else, that, uh, any other memories that? Uh, oh, there's heaps of memories I haven't mentioned. But <laughs> yeah, we can't. We'll... <laughs> you know, it's like it's like trying to summarise your life, mm. um, and obviously summarising two thousand years it can't mm. be summarised in a few hours, but. Um, it's like trying to summarise the major events of your life. I've missed out quite a lot of them. 
uh, from my first century life even mm. um, yeah let alone from our spirit life so mm. but let's well the spirit life goes for 2,000 years <laughs> exactly yeah. so we're not going to be able to uh, summarize it very quick no very well. so I guess highlights <laughs> highlights <laughs> well you know obviously for me a highlight was Mary passing um, in the sense that she you know I could now be with her again that was a really important thing for me and her um, so that that was a major event for me um, personal event you know there's a lot of what you would call impersonal events I suppose or more impersonal events not that my life's ever been impersonal but just things to do with my role more than my personal life so so my role is the is the redemption of mankind my personal life is just I'm just Jesus an average guy with a soulmate and who wants to love and be loved by my soulmate and 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 so I sort of see my role and my life as and my personal life as two separate things does that make sense mm. and most people in the spirit world do most people in the spirit world have a role that is to do with their passions and desires but but it's a sort of a role that's God's assigned to them and that's different to their personal life, you know, what, how, what they experience in their personal life, which is their life with their soulmate, the things that they enjoy together doing and so forth. And so um, I suppose you could separate my life into those two areas, into my personal life and then my role. And obviously in my role, I, I'm pretty busy all the time. Um, you know, being the first person who was in a condition of one with God, um, obviously that has a certain responsibilities attached to it that I accepted and desired to accept and so those responsibilities I maintain even now um, and then my personal life is a separate issue to that my personal life is like my life with Mary the things we enjoy personally doing and so forth mm. and it's the same after we pass so the things that affected my personal life after we passed uh, uh, firstly Mary's passing you know that that was a big event for me um, big event for her too she, because she'd missed me terribly and and she didn't feel me as strongly as she could have because of some of her emotions about my death um, and so when she came back in the spirit world she was quite traumatized when she first arrived because of her death but but that shortly changed into joy for her and and we progressed together fairly rapidly after that but bearing in mind that we lived in different locations for a long period of time um, but I could visit her anytime I wanted and that was most of the time so mm -hmm. um, so we spent a lot of time together um, and my and then my short shortly afterwards uh, actually about a month later all of my grandchildren passed and and Luke passed as well so that was sort of another sort of like a milestone in a way caring for the grandchildren when they passed and helping them understand the principles of the spirit world which they didn't understand as well as I did or Mary did so that was we sort of became their surrogate parents to a large degree after mm. they'd passed and then um, Sarah's passing our daughter's passing was another sort of milestone personal milestone and then um, by this stage, a lot of the disciples, so-called disciples and apostles had passed. So, you know, we met up with them in the spirit world, assisted each one of them to become at one with God in the spirit world because none of them had done that on earth. And, um, and you know, as this happened, uh, I was also always learning as well. So I was also always progressing to another dimension and, and any time I learnt anything new about another dimension, I'd set up some things to teach to the people in the previous dimension so that I could show them how to reach that location through their condition. So that was basically part of what I liked doing personally mm. besides my role. What about, uh, I, I guess, people on Earth would be interested in historical characters who have passed that you've met and you said you haven't, you haven't talked to everybody, you don't know everybody, it, just because you're Jesus doesn't mean you know six million people. Well, well there's, there's literally like 40 or 50 billion people 
um, you know, that I'm aware of in the spirit world at this point in time, and uh, in, in you know that come from this earth, and uh, and yeah, I don't know them all, obviously. <laughs> no, a lot of them know me, um, either by sight or by mm-hmm. reputation, <laughs> um, but I don't know them, you know. So um, yeah, it's not always easy to. Who who has made the most dramatic transformation since passing? Um, I would say probably in the in the time of my life, probably Cornelius. Um, he was in a very dark condition when he passed. And most people in that condition when they pass would remain in the hills for thousands of years. And he was in the hills for around 50 years. And it's pretty unusual. That's very unusual for someone in that amount of dark condition to actually... And you said this is because you made this connection with him while you were... Yeah, it's partly because of that, but it's also partly because of his nature. You know, his nature is... Yeah, he's just, he's a very humble person in his core, you know, his core nature. And he's also, um, he's also a very, like, he has a lot of very big desires as well. So a combination of humility and the desires caused him to make changes and probably pretty rapidly. So he, of all the disciples, he would have passed in, some of the, one of the most difficult conditions and yet changed the most rapidly he was the third his soul pair was the third one to reach at one moment with each other um, so given his condition on earth that's a fairly amazing thing um, when you consider that there's 22 dimensional existences to work your way through with all these lessons in love that are involved with each one of them um, you sort of start to and once you start doing it yourself and once you pass in the spirit world and see what it means to do that you'll see how great a transition that is mm-hmm. and um, so he would have to be one of the like people who I feel um, like made probably some of the biggest transitions I've seen mm-hmm. yeah there's others like Herod himself and, and also Nero. Those two passed in very dark conditions. And once they found the divine truth, Nero only relatively recently, but Herod found it quite quite early. But uh, once they made their transitions, you know, the, their transitions were quite stark as well because um, they were quite very, very dark characters mm-hmm. historically. Yeah. And famous people like Socrates and Plato and Martin Luther, you've mentioned. and Yeah, uh, you know, obviously Socrates and Plato I've met through their association with John. John was the person who assisted them with divine truth. But, um, but you know, through my association with John, I've, I've actually spoken to them and, and spent time with them, obviously. Um, Luther, well, his fascination, he's had a fascination with me while he was on earth, and so it was highly unlikely that he wouldn't meet me in the spirit world unless he didn't mm-hmm. long for it, and he did, so, and very early in his passing, so he passed into the hills, but he, but he, he was quite rapidly progressed after that um, mm-hmm. because of his desire for truth and his desire to learn about love. So, um, so he, he was he, he's got a lovely nature and character. He's very got a very investigative nature as well, like so that always appeals to me as a character. So yeah. You've mentioned uh, the Buddha. Yep. Uh, what's his name? Gautama. Um, I haven't spoken to him. No, no. you've said you, you, you I've you, attempted to. You've tried to, but you haven't been able to get close to him. No. Because he doesn't even see himself as an individual. No, he has this concept, intellectual concept of himself, which, which is that he's become all in all. He sees himself as, uh, he doesn't see himself as an individual, but rather as a collective. And he feeds off of the energy of all the projections from people in the spirit world and on earth. 
Uh, but he's still a, a sixth fear spirit. Yeah, yeah. And that's as far as you can go on the natural love path. That's correct, yeah. So he, he, he will not be able to progress any further until he sees himself as an entity again and until he actually starts connecting it with it emotionally. Um, and I don't know when that will occur. I've had many attempts to connect with him while I'm on Earth again, um, but each one of those attempts he ignores. So there's not much that can be done under those circumstances to talk to him. There are others that um, who, who are renowned historically in different religions that I have spoken to um, who have made transitions or, or who have been associated with certain religious movements here on earth who have made transitions. Um, what about the Wesleys, John and Charles Wesley? Yeah, they're both in the celestial realm. They made a transition pretty rapidly after they passed. Most people who were sort of reformationists on earth in the Christian faith mm. have made progress fairly rapidly because they had this investigative openness to new truth. Mm. And once they passed, they realized that a lot of what they believed was truth wasn't truth. And so then they just re-engaged that investigative nature. Um, and, and the Wesleys did, both did that. Mm. So... They re-engage that investigative nature, they accept more truth, and then they realize you know, the truth that they believed on earth wasn't true. And they go through this process of uh, you know, feeling some remorse about what they taught, um, but, but they were also very passionate about now teaching the truth in its true, unadulterated form. And so they progress quite rapidly, generally. Mm -hmm. yeah. So most of the Reformationists have progressed and are now in the celestial realms. Some presidents are in the celestial realms, um, US presidents, uh, for example. Um, Which ones? Well, Abraham Lincoln is, mm. uh, for example. Yeah. Um, you said that famous people have, find it difficult when they pass over? Many famous people do, particularly famous people who have been relying on the fame as an emotional crutch mm. for their life. They find it very difficult. Uh, people who um, who have been heavily engaged in sexual immorality on Earth find it very difficult to progress, usually for a long time, um, because they still engage in behaviour in the spirit world, and most of it's addictive and very damaging, and so it and it also prevents them from ever finding their soulmates or anything like that. So they can never and they can't ever become at one with God while they engage in that behaviour so um, so they often find it very very difficult after they've passed for a long mm. time um, there's some of the spirits of old you know who who found it a bit difficult initially um, when I say of old you know the person you know is Ammon and a man or Adam and Eve um, they they, you know, when they passed, obviously found it quite difficult initially. Um, and it wasn't until my coming in the first century that they learned about the divine love and started to long for that. Um, so they, some of, the, some of the older spirits have become so engrossed in creating their sideways movement in the sixth dimension that they think they're progressing when they're actually not. Mm. So it's sort of like it's sort of like you saying, "Oh, I need a change in my life, so I'm going to move to Sydney." But really, Sydney is very similar to Brisbane in a lot of ways, and it, you end up with the same life. Mm. It just feels it just feels different because you're in a different location. Mm. Does that make sense? But nothing's really changed. You you haven't changed much. Your family hasn't changed much. Your environment hasn't changed much. You, you know, nothing's really changed much. You, and particularly spiritually and emotionally, you haven't changed much. But you just feel better because you're in a different location. And most six fear spirits are like that. You know, they move from one location to another location sideways. They feel better. They feel like they have progressed or learned something new or whatever. But nothing's actually really changed. And, um, and it's not until they receive divine love that they realize even many times that nothing had changed and nothing could change beyond that point. But when they're channeling, they often talk about God and divine love, don't they? Of course. Yeah, because they use all the terminology. Mm. And spirits are adept at using terms, even spirits in the hells are adept at using terminology just to, you know, convince another person on, on earth that uh, 
that they understand what you're talking about. Mm. And I've had literally millions of conversations with spirits in the sixth dimension. I often go there to teach. And so I've had millions of conversations where there's been very large audiences of hundreds of thousands of people, even millions of people sometimes, um, that I've talked to about the principles of divine love and divine truth. But the unfortunate thing is they think that I'm talking about the same thing as they think. Mm -hmm. And because they think it's what what they think, they're not open to actually realizing that it's different to what they think. So are they just lacking in what you call humility? Just, yes. just not open enough? Yes, lacking in humility. Mm. And a desire for truth, mm. God's truth. Um, but But... You know, without the humility, nothing can happen. And most spirits who are in the natural love path in the spirit world lack humility. That's why they're on the natural path, love path. They want to be self-reliant rather than God-reliant. Mm -hmm. So, so they lack the humility to actually submit to their emotions and to submit to the emotional truth of what they're really experiencing. And as a result of that, they are quite often very difficult to reason with. And so, eventually, in the spirit world, I spent most of my time in the hells or on earth, trying to help people before they pass and trying to influence people and help people that way. And many th hundreds of thousands, millions of people have been helped that way, of course. Um, and I'm not the only person that was involved in that. So, mm. so I organised whole teams of people to be involved in these processes, helping people. Mm. Yeah. Okay, now we better, we better start to finish up. So, yep. so, so we'll get on to the last one, which is basically your current life and purpose now anyone can go on to youtube and check this out for themselves basically mm -hmm. they can watch how many hours of you on youtube i don't are know there, there must be enough, enough. Three, three or four hundred hours three or four hundred yeah. hours of you teaching so if they yeah. want to know about that they can find out but basically um two thousand years has passed uh why here why now um, well, it's, there's a lot of reasons why here, why now. Um, firstly, um, when you reach the condition of atonement with God and then atonement with your soulmate, and you, you're in a condition where you can feel God's desires quite strongly as well. And when I say quite strongly, it's probably an understatement. Um, and so you can feel God's desire to have all of her children know her. And you can feel God's desire to have all of her children feel her love. And the overwhelming feeling of that causes you to decide to assist in that process as much as you're able. And so when we were in that condition before we returned to Earth, we decided that there was a, if there was a chance that we could ever come back to Earth, that we would take it, that we would, we would come back to Earth for that purpose of... of doing those kind of things but there are also far more things that we wanted to i wanted to demonstrate and illustrate in the first century i illustrated how a perfect person a person who'd been wiped clean of the sins of their parents could become at one with god and i did that over a period of 31 years so it took 31 years from the time of my birth to the time i was 30 in my 31st year to become at one with god and and so in that process I illustrated, not only to people here on earth, but to people in heaven too, all the people in the spirit world, that, that you could become at one with God, that this was a prospect given to all humanity, not selectively, but it was dependent upon our individual will and desire that it occur. I also illustrated that a person could do it from a condition, with, oh, from a condition of being without sin in the first century, and I also illustrated the truths that were involved that you would have to come to accept at some point if you wanted to become at one with God. In other words, that you would have to accept this process of being humble, understanding the, the importance of truth and longing for that love to enter you. And, that, and I, it, under, I, I illustrated the power of forgiveness, of repentance, of love itself, and of becoming the power that you receive by becoming into that place of it one with God. I talked a lot about the terminology of of that, you know, like what that meant in terms of will, using your free will and how desires and morality impacted upon 
the, the choices, decisions you make that would affect whether you become at one with God or not. So all of those things were illustrated then. The problem is, over 2,000 years, those truths were established in the kingdom of heavens, what I call the kingdom of heavens, the first celestial sphere onwards. So these truths were firmly entrenched because every single person who arrives in that condition understands them. And therefore those truths are firmly entrenched in the heaven. So the kingdom of heaven was established. And that's why I said to Pilate that the reason why I'm here wasn't anything to do with the earth because my kingdom is in the heavens. The kingdom that I was establishing in the first time I was here was in the heavens, not on earth. But my intention in this life is to establish the kingdom of God on earth to, to do what all the Christians are praying for and that is to bring God's kingdom to earth and the way that happens is the same way as it was brought to the heavens and that is by people becoming a one with God while they're on earth not just one person but thousands of people or even millions of people or even potentially all of the human race becoming at one if they so choose if they so chose so, so the primary purpose of returning isn't just there are individual purposes to my return, but there are also big picture, what I would call big picture reasons for the return. And those big picture reasons all revolve around also illustrating some things that have never been illustrated before. Uh, a number of them are, one, firstly illustrating how a person who is imperfect can become perfected on earth. So not a person who's been cleared of their sin, but rather a person having sin and not having it cleared by any other means than going through this process that God has designed for them to go through to become perfect. Secondly, um, a woman on earth has never been in this condition. So one of the things I would you know, have loved to illustrate is to see a woman become at one with God while on earth. So that, so that the divine expression of femininity can be presented to earth because that's never been presented before. There's also a changing of all of the earth's structures and all of the earth's uh, intentions to bring everything into harmony of love. So bring politics into harmony of love, religion into harmony of love, economics into harmony of love, environmental things into harmony of love, the way that we live our lives into harmony of love. And the best way to do that is to illustrate it live rather than talk about it, is to actually show it. And so that requires a lot of myself personally. I've got to get be in that condition myself to illustrate it and then help other people get into the same condition so they can illustrate it. And when you have a, a number of people in the condition illustrating this, now we have some momentum where people can see the truth being displayed right in front of their eyes. So what, what I'd love to see is, a, is living examples all over the planet of what it means to live in harmony with divine truth and divine love being at one with god and if you can imagine that all over the planet you would have a living illustration you wouldn't have to talk about it anymore you have to go you want to see what living at one with god looks like go and see joe blow over there he's at one with god and you have a look at his life and you'll see and he doesn't even have to talk about it you just have to have a look at his life and you'll see and and these, there, there is also some other things that we'd, I'd like to accomplish while I'm here. One is I would love to see all the people in the hills finish up leaving the hills. <coughs> so that, that means there's currently billions and billions of people still in the hills of the spirit world. And while I'm on earth, I have a great opportunity to talk to them, a far better opportunity, in fact, than if Why I'm in the spirit world. Well, mostly because they have more rapport with people on the earth than they do in the spirit world. They, they look down rather than up. Okay. We, we often do that mm -hmm. ourselves and that's what they do. So they, they concentrate their effort onto the earth. Um, and so I'm one of the people on earth so I can actually engage this effort that they have, whether it be negative or not, and, and actually help them through a transition. So there's, all, there's this process of, and that I can see is God's desire too, is to roll up the heavens like a book scroll. Is a, is a quote from Isaiah. In, so, and as you roll it up, the different dimensions that exist, the hells, the dimensions of the hells all get rolled up. And eventually there's no hell. Nobody passes into a hell because everybody's condition has changed. So there's no need to pass into a hell. Mm. And 
and then of course you know eventually nobody will pass into anything other than the sixth dimension or above depending on their choices that they make so there are quite a lot of fairly large uh, agendas agendas or goals that I have I'd call them goals I wouldn't call them agendas probably just goals mm. I'm not going to be disappointed if they're not accomplished but um, and I'm very reliant on God I know how important God is in the process of these things being accomplished but these are personal desires that I have that I would love to see accomplished and that I know God wants accomplished. How could you see them not being accomplished? Well, there's always the potential of uh, my not dealing with certain emotions, for example, which prevent me from becoming at one with God, which would, which would prevent quite a lot of these things being accomplished. Um, there's my death, um, which a lot of spirits are uh, clamoring for at this point in time, um, which would prob possibly prevent some of these things from being accomplished. Um, there's um, the resistance of the people around me um, that can cause a, a lot of negative things to occur as a result of their misunderstanding. It's a bit like in the first century, um, a lot of the Jewish Sanhedrin misunderstood my desires because my disciples misrepresented my desires to them and that happens quite frequently now where people I know misrepresent my desires to other people and so therefore they get misinterpreted and that has its own mm -hmm. attraction so there are a number of things that are potentially able to occur um, I don't feel strongly they will but it depends a lot on my staying humble my staying loving of truth the basic principles that I'm teaching everyone that I've got to live. How much work do you think you've still got to go <laughs> on yourself? Uh, on myself? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's really not work on myself. It's allowing God to work on me. Um, so I sort of see it not as having to work on myself, but rather allowing mm -hmm. God to work on me. God's love will transform me. I've just got to allow the transformation. So there's five or six primary probably emotions that I've got to address uh, that I can see that I've really got to address soon for things to change soon. If things, for, think, for things to change soon, I've got to address them soon. Um, and as I make those changes, um, it'll be easy to see that they've been made once they've been made. Um, for me, firstly, but also for anyone around me because it's going to be easier for them to make the same transition after I've made it. Um, so, yeah, so I've just just got to continue working through my own issues of lack of humility. Because if I was completely humble, I'd already have made the transition. Um, so I've got to work through what I'm resisting, you know, what, what resistance I have to truth in certain areas. And there's some of the areas I have resistance to truth in are, are issues about my own identity still got resistance to truth there I've, I've still got some fear um, about what, what, what do you mean still resistance about your own identity well um, I've got I've got fear about fully accepting myself because if I fully accept myself that'll attract worldwide events um, and I and at this stage I feel like I don't want to attract them. There's a fear in me that I don't want to attract them. How would that attract worldwide events? Well, if I became a one with God tomorrow, mm. then I could heal again. Mm. Now, very rapidly after that, it will be well known that I can. And then there will be more media and more other attention and more scrutiny and so forth and so forth. And before you know it, you know, the fear I have, which I need to address is before I know it, my life with Mary might be so impacted that we don't get hardly any time together and all sorts of things may occur, you see? So mm -hmm. sort of like, so a lot of my fears are surrounding fully accepting myself and allowing what happens to happen mm -hmm. rather than trying to manage what happens. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. At the moment, there's still a tendency in me because of my try fear to try to keep everything low-key because mm -hmm. um, while I keep everything low-key, I get some space for myself and time for myself and can understand and that. so forth and um, whereas if if I just allow things to happen naturally and I address this issue of fear and I release the fear then things will happen a lot more rapidly and at the moment I'm afraid of that mm -hmm. and so so I resist that and I can see that I'm resisting it so I need to do something about that and mm -hmm. um, I've got some 
sadness about uh, my relationship with Mary still to work my way through about what's been happening in the spirit world over the past years uh, our separation uh, after we reincarnated how we've been apart for such a long time and some hurt and, and feelings about that that feel quite strong within me that I don't you know want to feel very strongly at this point obviously um, I've felt a lot about it already but there's still more to feel there um, there's a great sense of loss about my relationship with God that I have currently that, I, that I'm not grieving properly I get into the grief of it and then I skip out of it and I get into it I just sort of skirt around the edges of it I don't really get into it properly um, and so I don't get to I don't get to fully release it so you feel that you you have grief around a feeling of a lack of connection that you've once experienced yeah I have a memory of the connection an emotional memory and mm. an intellectual memory of the connection but but I don't have that same connection now it's like if mm. you imagine if you imagine right now um, imagine that you for the first 2,000 years of your life imagine you've been alive for 2,000 years and for the first 2,000 years of life you can never remember a time when you were without God so you never felt alone you never felt unsafe you never felt unwanted you never felt uncared for you never felt unloved you never felt any of those feelings that entire time right? and then, re then imagine it's all taken away from you in one act so how would you feel? you'd feel pretty Mm. sad like you've lost a lot of things and that's how I feel mm. and yet I'm not fully grieving all of the losses and th and while I don't grieve them I can't get back what I lost does that make sense mm. yeah so so I've lost all those things and I'm, I've worked my way through many of them but there's still some of them that I need to work my way through um, emotionally work my way through so so that I don't fe feel them like anymore I have this sense of this feeling if you like of having lost my memory um, like I, I know that in the future I'll be able to write down a formula for levitation that scientists will be able to replicate and produce machines from for example but at the moment I can't remember it and then I feel really frustrated and upset about that I can't remember it does that make sense? Because you used to know it. I used to know it, but I don't. I can't remember it now. Um, I used to know every language on the earth. So anytime somebody who has a different language talks to me, I feel really frustrated because mm. <laughs> I know I can. I used to remember that language. Now I don't. So I, I don't understand. You know, I, I feel. I can feel the emotion is this emotion of loss that I need to work my way through. And once I once I remember it and feel that feeling, then I'll remember the languages. But but I've got to go through the emotion to remember it. Things like that. Um, there's also things about my own power and nature that I had then that I don't have now. So I used to be able to in the spirit world and, uh, and there's my potential on earth in the first century too. I used to be able to create things out of nothing almost, it seemed like. So in the spirit world, my home in the spirit world, the home just before we left the spirit world that myself and Mary had was 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 around 25 cubic kilometers that was our house your house yeah in terms you've of downsized <laughs> so we've downsized a bit right and and all of the beauty of those surroundings we've lost that's what it feels like mm. um, the biggest things that I feel I've lost are um, my constant friendships with my spirit friends that, that I used to enjoy immensely. And the biggest thing that I feel I've lost is this feeling that I've lost this connection with God because it's not permanent again. And so it just there's an immense amount of grief associated with that. That's my <coughs> biggest grief. And so um, I've, I, and I'm, I get into that emotion for an hour maybe you know, in the course of a day but it's not long enough I'm not really in it properly mm. so I need to go through those emotions still uh, and I feel once I get through those then, it, then I'll be much closer 
Uh, but you're not setting yourself any uh, time limits on this or any... Uh... No, because you, there's no need to, for a start. You know, God, we're not in a competition with anybody or anything. God doesn't... Hey? Not in a race? No, not in a race, no. Um, God doesn't have all these expectations of me that I do certain things in a certain time frame that God wants me to do and so forth. And um, it's only... It's only people's expectations of me, you know. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, so at the moment, people expect me to be perfect when I'm not, mm-hmm. um, and even if I tell them I'm not, they still expect me to be perfect. <laughs> um, and even if I tell them why I'm not, they still expect me to be perfect. And, and so, you know, I've had to grieve the expectations, you know, let go of the expectations that others have. So whenever I say, "Oh, I'm Jesus," there's this automatic picture that a person has in their own mind often generated by the bible or other Mm. things which they then expect me to be Mm. and uh, and so i I have to work my way through some of that emotionally as well still like why they you know how how it hurts that they expect me to be something that i don't expect them to be Mm. and things like that but uh, yeah, once I get through those particular things, um, which I don't know how long it will take, like in the first century, from the time that I became self-aware that I was the Messiah to the time that I became the Messiah was a period of 13 years or so. And that was from a condition of having no sin, from a condition of having no terrible feelings about myself or anything mm-hmm. like that. So potentially it could take longer in this life than 13 years. And I've been, um, I I feel I started my journey probably about 15 years ago, but my realisation of who I was, was about, or who I am, is happened about seven or eight years ago. So, you know, if it takes 13 years, then then it's going to be another five years. Um, You know, it'll be possibly a comparable time to Mm. what it took me in the first century. Um, Yeah. And I don't feel any personal misgivings about that I know other people do but but I don't mm. other people want me to hurry up <laughs> and prove one way or the other whether what I'm saying is true or not yeah yeah, yeah. well I can understand that because yeah. they want evidence everyone wants evidence yeah but see you know. see this is the problem with the divine love path is if you actually embrace the path you will automatically have the evidence you need anyway Mm. and waiting for another person to provide evidence is actually not the fastest way to get to God the fastest way to get to God is wait for God to provide the evidence I guess it's their own <laughs> doubt yes you know is this captain of the ship mad or what you know? exactly exactly <laughs> and I can understand that to a degree but but I I am not reliant on another person to tell me that it's right or wrong and I never have been so this is why I don't really understand why other people are reliant on me so much mm. does that make sense mm. it's sort of like for me it go for me it sort of feels like well no no you're totally capable of doing this yourself mm. if you know the basic principles and um, you're totally capable of becoming one with God before I am mm. you, you've got far less emotional injuries to work your way through than I have even right at this moment um, well, that's maybe not strictly true, but but there are a certain group of emotional injuries that you don't have to work through that I do, and mm. um, mm. and so you've got just as much um, possibility of becoming at one with God as rapidly as I could from this point of time. Um, so why would you wait for me to do it when you could possibly do it before me? And not that it's a race or a competition, but one of us being there would be great. <laughs> are, you, are you a good runner? Am I a good runner? Yes, you used to be. Used to, I see you stretching, and you're uh, you look like a, a sprinter sometimes when you give your seminars. No, I don't know if I'm a good runner. Because <laughs> um, that's the one race I can beat you in. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> no, I've never really been a good runner. Um, yeah, I, I'm more of a. Do um, you see? To for a lot of things. If there's emotions in your body, they affect you markedly. And I've had a lot of grief in my body and a lot of fear of grief. And so that caused me to have very sh- small respiratory uh, capacity. So when I ran long distances, I really struggled. Now I don't, but mm. I used to. Um, and the development of the lower half of my body is undeveloped because of the emotions that I'm storing in the lower, the fear in particular that I've stored in the lower half of my body, mm. which will repair itself once I'm at one with God. But um, you know that they are, those some of those fears are still present, which affect my development, the lower half of my body. 
So after I've de dealt with those things, I expect I'll grow two or three inches probably, and um, you know, and and be capable of running better than I currently <laughs> am. <laughs> and you beat me at a race as well. But I don't have mm -hmm. any feeling of it's all got to happen yesterday. I don't sort of feel like I have a lot of patience with the process and trust in the process, I suppose. Mm. Whereas I feel a lot of people, a lot of people on the planet are used to getting everything yesterday. You know, like I think of something and all I've got to do is go out and get it on the credit card, that kind of thing. And, and if soul development is like that, um, it wouldn't be very sincere, but if soul development is like that, I'm sure quite a number of people would have already embraced it. Mm. But soul development's not like that. You know, becoming one with God is not like that. That's why nobody on this planet has actually embraced it to the completion, uh, aside from myself in the first century. And, and, and the reason why is because a lot of times people expect things to happen a lot faster than they have patience for. Uh, and they often have very little patience for themselves in terms of their own development. So, so for me, I, I just feel like, no, I, I, I want to be patient with myself and understanding of myself. I don't want to dally around, but, but I need to understand every change that happens. I need mm -hmm. to feel every change that happens. And, and that means sincerity has to occur in the change. Mm -hmm. And that's the way God designed the way, the path. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I've heard a, uh, one of the uh, fellows in your seminar uh, inspired by you. He said, AJ, you don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk. <laughs> yep. So I guess that's the, uh, I guess that's what you would describe the, the way, the life, mm. the truth and the life. Yeah, and that's why I said to the people in the first century, I am the way and the, the truth, truth and the life. life. Mm. Because, because if you can copy what I do, you will become at one with God. And, and, of course, a lot of people in the first century thought that was quite arrogant to say. A lot of Christians now don't think it was arrogant of me to say it 2,000 years ago, but they mm. think it's arrogant of me to say it today. Yeah. But, but it hasn't changed. It's the same process. And, and, and if I have a strong desire to connect to God, and, and the same applies to yourself, if you have a strong desire to connect to God and you embrace the way, everyone else will see through your embracing of the way how the way can affect their life. Mm. And, um, and that's a basic principle of truth, that the first person embracing a course of life or a course of action is going to be the way shower for the others who follow. Mm. Yeah. And that, well, that's probably a good place to finish. Mm. The, way, the way, the truth and the life. <laughs> Sums it all up, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, once again, it's been a pleasure. Same goes, my friend. Thanks yeah. very much, OJ. Yeah. Yeah. How are you finding this whole process? Jeff, like, oh, loving it. But yeah, I, I, it's. Uh, is the camera off? <laughs> <laughs> we can leave it on, can't we? You, you don't mind explaining to how, how you're finding it, sweetie? Um, yeah, like, um, what started off as a study of you <laughs> yep. has become a study of me. Awesome. That's exactly the under um, <laughs> underlying goal. Yeah, I'll be totally honest. You know, I came out here to study you psychologically. Yeah as probably someone else has before, and I thought, yeah. this is, you know, I have an interest in religion, yeah. I have an interest in psychology, here's someone who is melding the two together, yeah. um, who has a lot to say, who is clearly not a madman, yeah. as uh, even Millikan said in his blog, he's met three Jesuses, <laughs> the other two were mad, this guy is clearly not mad, yeah. he sincerely believes he is Jesus. Um, so, yeah, what started off for me as a study of you, yep. listening to you and observing your expounding of the truths yep. that you call God's truths, yep. uh, have resonated yeah. in me, yeah. uh, especially with a lot of a lot of things that I thought previously in 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 my life, yep. you know, 20, 30 years ago, where I detached from the church because I didn't really have, I was like Jonathan Livingston Seagull, sort of flying yeah. by myself, yeah. and I didn't really find a home. Yeah. yeah. So I left. Yeah. I left the church because I didn't, it didn't appeal, I couldn't, it didn't resonate with me. Yes. 
but yeah. but there were certain things that I tried to teach like you were trying to teach to the people in the church, but they just said I was Theoretical. I, I needed to be prayed for. <laughs> yeah. And so so I basically just left. Mm. And um mm. Yes, but since uh, since meeting yourself and Mary and um, putting some of these truths into practice, which resonate as a truth, yeah, um, it's it's turned into a study of me. Yeah, yeah. Which which is good. Which is which is the underlying goal. It, it? is. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's about your personal relationship with God, your personal relationship with yourself, your yeah. personal relationship with other people in bringing it all into harmony with love and this is what i find fascinating about the divine truth you learn the externals and eventually you're forced into being introspective and looking yeah. at yourself in the process yeah. and it's just wonderful so yeah. my friends keep saying, is he really jesus is he i say i don't care anymore <laughs> it doesn't really matter <laughs> you know but I, I don't uh, i'm not interested in going down that line anymore yeah um the experience that i've had is probably what I would have expected if I'd met Jesus, you know. <laughs> there was a, there, the, There's a truth that I can see as a truth. Yeah. And there is a truth that I haven't seen before that yeah. I need to explore. Yeah. And there is a confrontation. Yeah. Uh, a personal confrontation. An internal war, if you like. Yeah. Almost. Mm. And that's what I would have expected. Yeah. So. And that it, it's that internal war, I feel that the majority of people are afraid of embracing you know they're afraid of really embracing this process of personally growing into a new condition into a new state you know that they, they, we like safety mm. and no change means safety to us most of the time when actually i find personally that if you don't change then you're in an unsafe position because you can only ever be what you currently are and that's a sad thing if for, for the majority of the humankind. That's a very sad thing mm. to only be what you currently are when you have so much potential to become something completely different if you just embrace a process that God designed to embrace in the first place. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And it brings a little bit more because I think we all have a yearning for a purpose. Yes. And to know that there's a purpose. Yes. And like I said, as Richard Dawkins says that he believes the universe operates out of pitiless indifference, it's not very comforting, is it? <laughs> you know, yeah. I'd like to think that there is some sort of reason for my personal development. Mm. And I think we all do. We want to know that there's a there's a reason and that when we die, when it's not just all going to dissolve. Yeah. And of course, every spirit knows that when you die, it all doesn't dissolve. So it's... So that's an instantaneous change that you make as soon as you pass, generally. You realise, oh, my life hasn't dissolved. I'm still here and I've still mm. got the same thoughts and I've still got the same memories and I've still, you know, oh, my body's a little different. I wonder why that is. But, you know, you look much the same, generally, as well. And and so, you know, the majority of people after they pass instantly accept that one, you know, that one truth, which is that there is no, there's no death that of the soul if you like or no no death of our what people are referring to nowadays as their consciousness but um but the key is to take that further i feel like to actually enjoy your life not just be afraid of a transition or afraid of death or afraid of living life here or in the spirit world for that matter mm. yeah and also the humility angle of being open not just to truth but to emotion yeah um it seems like, you know, everybody's walking around crying, you know, in the process. But as you say, leading to a fuller experience of life. Yes. Like the girl in the seminar who had suffered sexual abuse yeah. as, at a young age. She was now, because of that experience and that emotional injury, was incapable of having a relationship yeah. with, a, with a man. Yeah. And so there is an ex a whole experience that until until she's dealt with that emotion, That's right. there's a whole ex a life experience that is denied, she's going, to, it, her. She is denied yeah. to her. Yeah. And and I can see how you say that. Okay, it's the same with our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. You do the same thing mm -hmm. with these emotional injuries, because she also over that. 
period of time with those injuries, then constructed a whole pile of preconceived ideas about men. Yes. And this is why she couldn't connect with men, because men are only after this, they're only after that. Yeah. And these are ideas that other women don't have. Yes. Yeah. So they're obviously false, but exactly. in her mind they're truths. Exactly. Yeah. But they, and this they, is what this is where I think the big failure of uh, New Age religion is. You know how New Age religion has this focus on, oh, it's all truth. You know, it's all per. You know, your truth, my truth. It doesn't really matter, does it? Mm. You know, they they have this idea, but the reality is it does matter because mm. the truth, God's truth, will always free you. It sets you free. The other so-called truths finish up binding your life into this place of fear that we finish up living most of our life justifying but never really experiencing our life fully and I, I find that's quite sad and this is where I find that religious viewpoints and teachings even new age which I feel, feel is a religion even science is a religion and all these what I'd classify as religious viewpoints or beliefs finish up defining our possibilities when God designed our possibilities to be endless and I find that that's really that's a sad fact about human life mm. on earth is that because we limit ourselves so much through our emotional experience we finish up shutting down all the potential possibilities that we have yeah and that we have to give to others as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But it's uh, yeah, it's an awesome journey. Like mm. every single person I find who really finds and discovers, you know, the path of God's truth, um, and actually embraces it and realizes it for what it is, is fascinated from that time on forever. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the spirits in the spirit world right now who are completely fascinated, who know far more than any person on earth would even conceive of knowing. And yet they're totally fascinated with what they can still discover. Mm. Yeah. That's what I love about it the most. Mm. God's designed this eternally fascinating system. Yeah. 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 We just have to be like children and yeah, discover yeah. it and like absorb children. It and be humble to the process, you know. Mm. Yeah. That was good. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time, Jeff. Yeah.